what are you doing October 1st through 3rd? I want to hang out with you just south of Nashville, Tennessee, down in Franklin. I'm going to be keynoting the Mental Health Marketing Conference, and I would love for you to be there. We are also sponsoring the clinical track where there are going to be tons of amazing trainings all for you in private practice. This is the national gathering for marketers and clinicians in mental and behavioral health. You're not going to want to miss this awesome conference. It's the one conference I'm keynoting this year, and you can read more over at mhmarketing.org. Also, Steve over at Mental Health Marketing has given 25% off to any practice of the practice listeners that want to come to this. Whether you're coming in person or online, you're going to want to use promo code Joe at checkout to get 25% off. I would love for you to come in person for my closing keynote on Thursday, October 3rd at the Mental Health Marketing Conference. But if you can come online, that works as well. Can't wait to hang out with you in Tennessee. Again, that's mhmarketing.org and use promo code Joe at checkout to hang out with me October 1st through 3rd, 2024. This is the Practice of the Practice Podcast with Joe Sanok, session 1023. I'm Joe Sanok, your host, and welcome to the Practice of the Practice podcast. I hope your July is going great. Uh, We talk about starting a thriving private practice you absolutely love uh, on the show four times a week. Uh, We have had such amazing sponsors that they just, they want to, you know, get us to be in front of you and in front of them and all that. So we are doing, you know, four to five episodes every single week. Um, actually, it looks like as I look at the the sheet right now, we're now doing five episodes a week. So we must have sold some sponsor spots. So five days a week, we're doing this show uh, for you, interviewing some amazing people. Uh, if you missed our series, uh, we've had some really interesting series. Back in May, um, starting back in episode 989, we did our psychedelic assisted therapy series. Uh, we did 10 episodes about psychedelic assisted therapy. So uh, we covered MDMA, we covered psilocybin, ibogaine, ayahuasca. We talked politics and best practices about where kind of government regulation and the FDA with MAPS is going. So whether or not you are planning to do psychedelic assisted therapy, your clients are going to have questions about it. So it's just good if you missed any of those, go back to those. And then also uh, starting in episode 1007, we started our summer series of movers and shakers. So we talked with the lady Tabitha, who was working in the White House and, and talked about growth cycles. Um, we talked about the balance of your intuition and goals. We talked about staying inspired. Um, we we talked to uh, Goop Lab uh, founder, uh, Elise uh, Lohan, who is a co-founder of Goop Lab, who just wrote a book. So a lot of really interesting shows this summer that we've been able to dig into. Um, and, you know, that idea of leveling up through consulting, through thinking about what you're doing really well. Uh, It's just so important. I was just um, actually in a mastermind group that I run. And um, there's a lady who's doing a really amazing job with with helping people that have uh, kids ages like two to five to do really, really good, um, just like behavior management. Um, And she said, man, there are so many armchair experts out there that uh, they don't know what they're doing. They don't have a PhD like I do. And not that that makes me perfect, but, you know, I get the science and it's really just so simple to help a a child have better behavior. And it can be so predictable. And all of us in the mastermind group were like, that's your tagline. You have to do that. And so we just encouraged her, keep track of whenever you have a client or see on social media, some bad advice on parenting that's just pisses you off. Uh, And she was like, oh my gosh, that's a really fun piece of homework to leave this mastermind group with. Um, And sometimes that's what it is. Just keeping track of the things we're saying over and over. Uh, You know, if you're a therapist that works with preschoolers and someone says, you know, I think celery water is going to just help my kid. Well, maybe that might help, but it also might be some good behavior management would help your kid too. And so keeping track of those random things you hear can set you up in a different way to be a consultant, to be an influencer, to reach out and help the people you want to help. And that's why I'm so excited to have Amy Anderson with us today. Amy's co-founder of Brinson Anderson Consulting, which is a healthcare business coach for surgeons and their staff. She has 20 years of experience working in surgical practices, and she understands the nuances and challenges of private practice, academic centers, and hospital-based medical group practices. Surgeons and staff appreciate her approachable style 
and her practical advice. Amy, welcome to the Practice of the Practice podcast today. Thanks, Joe. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah. You know, what I love about having a consultant like yourself on the show is that you're in a slightly different space, helping surgeons um, be able to set up their practices. And yet I'm sure you and I are going to, in the next half hour, magically discover a bunch of overlap that we didn't even talk about before we jumped on the show. That's right. I think um, anything, you know, it's all in the healthcare space. So a similar industry in the sense that, um, you know, we're dealing with healthcare, whether it's, you know, medical health, mental health, wellness, anything in between there. Um, and so, but there's a, there's a business aspect to it. Um, and that's often sometimes more challenging than the actual healthcare component. And so that's kind of the space I live in um, and, and love what I do. Now, was your background in business or going to school for business before you started doing consulting? Well, that's a great question. So initially, I was a pre-medical student um, and had, you know, full intentions of going to med school and becoming a physician myself. And I got a part-time job as an undergrad as the medical records clerk, um, you know, pre-EMR when we had paper charts. And uh, I, that was my job was to pull the charts for appointments, file them back away, file away all the paperwork. Um, and that was my first entry point into working in a medical office. And it just happened to be a plastic surgery office. And I stayed there through undergrad and basically learned all of the jobs in the office um, outside of patient care. Um, you know, so from front desk, I learned how to do insurance authorizations. I learned a little bit about billing, um, all of those roles. And so I realized I really loved that side of healthcare. Um, and I, at that time, just wasn't committed to the long haul of a medical school and residency. So made the decision to stay in healthcare, but pivot and do a master's in business administration. Um, and I guess the rest is history. I've, I've been working with physicians and in medical practices ever since. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I never did any business classes in college. And uh, it started with me just realizing that that set me up for a difficult journey in starting my own business. <laughs> and so a lot of it was kind of learning as I went. And when I started the podcast, it was great because then I got to interview all these really smart people and not have to pay them for consulting. And so <laughs> the first like year of my podcast was literally, oh my gosh, I don't know even what SEO is. I got to find some top SEO people and just interview them for the podcast. So um, that kudos to you for going to get the MBA. Uh, that's a lot of work to get that. Um, so how did you, so frame out kind of who you tend to work with, what kind of practices, what kind of medical surgeons are you working with mostly if you were to break down the, the consulting clients that you tend to work with? Yeah. So my firm, Brinson Anderson, we work primarily with plastic surgeons, otolaryngologists, ENT docs, um, and orthopedic surgeons. And that's just really because my business partner, Cheyenne Brinson and I, those are the specialties we have decades of experience with at this point. Um, we could work with any surgical specialty or, or really we, we've had some others. Functional medicine is, is one that I've started to do some, a little bit more work in. Um, and, but we've decided to stay niche um, because as we've been approached by some other providers, I mean, I'm interested. I always get really excited talking about someone's practice and their business. Um, but I've realized by developing an expertise in a couple of these core specialties, like we know it inside, outside and upside down. Um, if they're doing insurance billing, we know their their ICD-10 and CPT codes through and through. We know just the different nuances with the different insurance carriers, what they cover, what they don't. Um, we have an understanding of pricing and just the culture and dynamic of, of those specialties. So um, personally, I focus my time mostly on plastic surgery and aesthetics. And that's where I think the functional medicine has come into play because a lot of wellness practices um, are adding an aesthetic component to it. Mm. Yeah. So when you're helping um, set up a new practice, what are some of the, and I'm, I'm sure we could spend you know, weeks going through this because this is a sometimes complex thing, but what are some of the major maybe milestones um, that a new practice goes through? Sure. Well, the, the very first thing that I tell somebody who's starting a practice, um, assuming in most situations you have a brick and mortar 
uh, office um, to see patients in, and this isn't all virtual healthcare, um, it's the real estate. And it, when people ask, well, how long is it gonna take to get my practice started? I often say the real estate component is the driving factor because finding appropriate space, negotiating the lease or purchase, um, doing any renovations, usually there's some sort of updating that's required. I mean, that can be three months at best, I would say, to over a year, depending on the construction needs. And so the timeline really starts by finding that location and having an idea of how long that build out is going to be. And anyone who's ever done any construction projects, either at home or in a business setting, knows that those are so unpredictable. Um, and so much of it's out of our control. So the timeline is an important conversation early on so we can you know, reasonably understand how much time do we have to pull everything else together. We really have to work it around the, the real estate component. Mm. And then what's kind of next after that? Yeah. Um, so one of the things when, when I'm working with, with a surgeon, we have a very detailed new practice startup checklist. Um, and actually, I just recently put it on my website as a free download, um, kind of giving it to everybody because I, I want everybody to have the steps needed to do it um, to, so, so nothing gets missed. I really want um, physicians, clinical providers to have every resource at their disposal. And so, um, you know, that's my website's brinsonanderson.com. There's a tab for practice startup and you can download the checklist, even if you're not a plastic surgeon. 95% of it's going to apply. So I encourage you guys to, to get that. Um, and so my role is kind of being project manager and going through every step of it. So things that, you know, you don't necessarily think about. Um, most medical providers understand you need professional liability insurance, malpractice insurance. Um, you also need the business owner's insurance, workers' comp insurance. Uh, unemployment insurance. There's all these other commercial business insurance needs. And so getting, you know, educating physicians on that and getting them connected to a good broker who understands um, what the appropriate limits are. I can't forget to mention cyber insurance. That's a really important one. Um, but but that's just one area that, that we would educate them on. Um, the other probably big conversation that we spend a lot of time on is, are we going to take insurance or not? Um, and, and this, you know, in my, my physicians who are plastic surgeons, I have, they're probably about a 50, 50 split where at least half of them are very interested in continuing to do reconstructive surgery, which is covered by insurance, um, as well as cosmetic surgery, which is self pay. Um, and I have an, the other half say, no, I just want to do cosmetic surgery. Um, it's a big decision because, as I'm sure you know, um, choosing to do insurance can help you get off the ground with higher volume of patients initially, um, but we're dealing with reimbursements that maybe are not so favorable. <laughs> um, and then just that the, there's a significant administrative portion of accepting insurance uh, helping patients understand their benefits, getting authorizations, billing those claims, all of that that goes into billing. Um, so it's a big decision. So I'd say that's a, another early conversation we have to determine what route are we going to go with this practice? Is it going to be all self-pay or are we going to accept insurance? Mm -hmm. Upheal is an AI-powered platform designed specifically for therapists like us. Now, I know what you might be thinking, AI and therapy, how does that work? Let me tell you, Upheal is a lifesaver when it comes to streamlining your administrative tasks. As therapists, we all know how crucial it is to save time whenever we can. After all, our clients deserve our undivided attention and energy. That's where Uphill comes in. It transcribes, summarizes, and analyzes our therapy sessions, helping us write those detailed progress notes up to 90% faster. Can you imagine saving six to 10 hours per week? That's precious time that we can use to see more clients or simply recharge our own batteries. Just a few minutes after you finish a session, you get a pre-drafted, editable progress note complete with session summary and breakdown of all the topics that were covered. 
It also provides session analytics that help you measure speech-based metrics like talking ratio, speech cadence, sentiment, and tense. Also, it's 100% HIPAA compliant, making it secure for both therapists and clients. The best part, it's available for all EHRs with their browser extension. So if you're ready to experience the game-changing power of AI in your therapy practice, head on over to uphill.io slash joe and let AI write your therapy notes for you. That's uphill.io slash joe. Get 50% off your first three months of Uphill with the promo code Joe over at uphill.io forward slash Joe. Again, that's uphill.io forward slash Joe. Trust me, your future self will thank you. And now let's dive into today's episode. One thing I love to talk about is is mindsets, um, because I think that can get in the way of our potential growth um, and can really stifle kind of different areas. What are some mindsets that you see with surgeons that um, they have to overcome to get to a level of success that that maybe is, is common for the newer surgeon? Well, the newer surgeon or, or somebody who's younger in practice, I, I say this and I always tell them, I, I hope they don't take offense, but when they're just out of residency or, or fellowship training, um, they're still learning to be a doctor, right? They're still learning the clinical skill set and evaluating a patient, diagnosing, coming up with appropriate treatment plans. When you also start a business, you don't have the luxury to only focus on patient care. And so um, I, I get it's the mindset of just, you know, understanding that your role is no longer just being the doctor, or just being the provider. You're the provider and the business owner. And so really putting on that identity early on um, and understanding there are decisions that have to be made about the practice. Um, And that should be exciting, right? You get to design this to be exactly what you want it to be. Um, But you can't bury your head and say, well, somebody else is going to deal with the business part. I'm just going to be the provider. So I think just putting on that identity that I'm a provider and a business owner is really important early on. Mm. Yeah. I think that um, there's also, at least for a lot of the therapists that I work with, understanding how much they should be taking on versus how much they should have an assistant taking on, Mm. how much they should outsource, um, you know, what it's going to take in regards to capital. I imagine just the capital investment for most surgeons is significant compared to therapists. I mean, we just need a, a living room type setting. Um, is that an area that typical surgeons struggle with in regards to finding capital or do they kind of understand that that is kind of comes with the territory? It's a great question. Um, so yes, there is a bigger capital um, investment need. I, I always encourage surgeons to start modestly. It's, relatively easy to build and expand. It's really hard if you bite off more than you can chew in the beginning, and then you have giant overhead obligations. So um, I would not encourage a surgeon to build out an office with its own operating suite um, right away or or straight out of training. Get a little office with two or three exam rooms um, and a little bit of an admin space and, you know, do your surgeries at a hospital or surgery center. That's perfectly fine. Um, reminding them that when patients seek, seek them out, they're not coming for the physical office, right? They don't honestly care as long as it's clean and organized and aesthetically pleasing. They're coming for the doctor, right? They're coming for that surgeon and their name and their brand. And so, so focusing on that, um, to your point about delegating, this is big because I think anybody who's, you know, at this level of healthcare, um, you know, has gotten there by being really good at what they do and being organized and, and, and talented in all areas. And to realize that maybe you're good at a lot of things, but let's focus on the things that only you can do um, that are the highest and best use of your time. And yes, delegate other things to an administrative um, person. For example, I was speaking with a surgeon a few months ago who had just started his practice. Um, he did not yet have a website. And when I asked him who was he working with, he said, well, I decided to build my own website. And I said, oh, is 
is this an interest or hobby? Like, do you have a lot of experience building websites? He says, no, I have no experience. I was just going to get on YouTube and watch some videos. And I said, while I believe you absolutely could watch videos and put time into that and probably come up with an average website, why are you doing that? You know, this is absolutely the time to find a professional who knows what they're doing. It's often not as expensive as you think it is. And your time is something I can't get back. And I need your time focused on the, you know, creating your surgical protocols, writing your pre and post-operative instructions. I can't do that for you because that's based on your clinical protocols, but we can find somebody to design your website. And uh, about a month later, um, he had followed my advice, hired somebody, and he said, oh my goodness, Amy, I'm so grateful that you talked to me out of doing that because I would probably be crying at this point, um, no further along at having a website and, and feeling really discouraged. So, you know, that was just one example of things of, of recognizing, I'm sure you can do it, but it's just not the best use of your time. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you were to think about the average therapist that's growing a practice or a clinic, um, what's some advice that you would say that you've learned in helping surgeons that you think would also overlap into the therapy world? I, I think this is universal that patients might come to you initially because you had a catchy website or you're on their insurance plan or you're, they drove by and saw your sign, right? Any number of reasons they come to you. They stay with you for the relationship. And I think this is universal across all specialties that creating a beautiful, flawless patient experience is so essential. Um, and so what does that mean? It, it starts with how easy is it to find you and get in touch? Are we utilizing technology um, to your benefit to offer online bookings or texting with somebody at the practice to help them schedule? Um, you know, I always I laugh when I talk about using technology to help people pay. We should make it really easy for people to pay, right? <laughs> um, so accepting Apple Pay or Google Pay or text to pay or having credit card on file, those are relatively inexpensive tools um, that one can help your business be more profitable, but two patients really want that. They just want it to be easy. I mean, my vet has had my credit card on file for years. The fact that I can walk out and I don't have to stop and pay with my two dogs pulling in me, pulling me in different directions is really, it's actually a selling point for me. One of the reasons why I like going there. So, um, so making it really easy for, for people to get in touch with you, book appointments, um, and then when they come in to see you, of course, um, it's all about that relationship that they feel um, seen and respected and heard. Um, doesn't mean that there's no boundaries or, you know, they come and go when they want. Um, you know, we do have protocols in the practice for a reason. Um, but ultimately, you know, that's that's your best form of, of marketing is keeping the patients you have because, they love you and they 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 see the benefit of coming there. And then that word of mouth referral. Um, we all have friends. We all talk about um, our, I, mean, I shouldn't say all, but many of us talk about our healthcare providers um, and are pretty open about it. And, and you can make some assumptions that our friend groups tend to be the same socioeconomic status. And so um, if I can afford to see you as a as a provider, then so can my friends in most cases. And so that word of mouth really goes far. And so I, I just can't emphasize enough, focus on the relationships and everything else will fall into place. Mm. I love that you talked about unnecessary barriers, uh, especially around like your vet. Um, you know, just recently I've been changing primary care doctors and my old primary care doctor, I, I sent a message through the portal saying, you know, I want to sign a release. And then they like called me and wanted me to come into the office to sign the release. And I'm like, isn't there something digital? And they sent me a text that had a digital link, but then I needed a password. And it was just like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> this is ridiculous. And then the new place, they mailed me all my new paperwork. And I'm yeah. just like, is there a place online I can fill this out and they're like nope and it looked like it had been scanned and recopied for the oh, last 20 yeah. years and I'm like if you didn't come as highly recommended as like these two doctor friends of mine are like this guy is the best 
I would totally not go to this practice. I'm like, Amy, you should go work with these two places. Yeah. Uh, it's so, so is true. There, I mean, we and we make judgments off of those interactions before before you're meeting that primary care doctor, right? Before you're even talking to a human, this is that experience. And so it does matter. It, it's it, It's more important, I think, than most people think about. Well, and I think that like people just expect it now. And, you know, our local, we have a local small bakery that's just down the road. So my daughter's birthday is coming up. And so we ordered this like custom cake wanting to, you know, support the local bakery. So you put in the form online. There very easily could have been a pay now thing there. Their process is to call you and get the credit card over the phone. And if they don't catch you, then the cake order doesn't go through. And it's like, I need this cake on Saturday for her birthday party. And it's like, I think that therapists um, oftentimes don't understand how those really simple logistical things, unnecessary clicks and unnecessary this and that and phone calls really get in the way of just having a full practice. Um, you know, even just being able to on your website when it says schedule an intake, that it actually goes to a scheduling tab where someone can schedule their intake and then get the paperwork to come in instead of going back and forth with the front desk for two weeks trying to jump on a phone call to just say the same thing you could have said online. What are just a handful of other quick tips that people can learn to start to automate the process? Maybe you have some tools or some ways that you think through having those those automations or operations be a little bit stronger in a practice. Um, well, I mean, we've, we've touched on the big ones. I think that intake process, nothing makes me more irritated when I have to fill out my name, birth date, and address on five different forms. Mm. Um, I'm like, I gave it to you already. You fill it in. And, and I don't actually say that because I'm, I, I just, I bite my tongue, but I really want to say that to, to offices that, that ask for that information over and over again. So making it an online form. If you have an electronic health record that has a portal, um, you know, those are plus minus, right? They're, they're supposed to be better. They're not always the most patient friendly, um, but I want to optimize what I can use that for. If not, I mean, you can do things with DocuSign or Adobe Sign that just makes them easy, fillable forms that you can capture an electronic signature on. Um, and you can work with those companies to make sure it's done in a HIPAA compliant way. That's obviously really important. Um, and then to your point, I, and I said this earlier, making it easy for people to pay, having that payment link. Um, you know, other things like appointment reminders, um, you know, that are text. We just live in a text culture. Uh, if everything is relying on a phone call or an email, you're missing a big part of your audience. You're a, a part of your patient population. Uh, people are far more likely to open and read a text message than they are an email. And that's if your email even makes it to their inbox and not to their junk folder. So really embracing texting um, and again, different CRM systems that are out there um, or having something integrated. A lot of times the phone system you're using, um, you know, any of the internet based phone systems have texting as a feature. You can download it as an app on your phone. So you're not giving out your personal number or anything like that, um, but it's texting through the business number. I just think giving people that accessibility. If your patients are busy working professionals, you're not going to get them on the phone, right? I'm not picking up my phone during the day because I'm in meetings and I'm working and I'm traveling, um, but I'm going to respond to texts. And, you know, second to that, I would see an email. Mm. So good. Amy, uh, if every private practitioner in the world were listening right now, what would you want them to know? Oh, goodness. Um, starting a private practice is a beautiful thing. Um, it's a ton of work. So be prepared for it. But there's, there's, I haven't talked to a provider yet that, that regrets the decision. They might say it's harder than I ever dreamed it would be. And it's immensely more gratifying than I ever imagined. So if you go in, you've got to go all in. Um, it does take everything you've got. Um, but there are tons of resources out there and you can do this. Um, and I just wish them all the most success. Mm, I love that. If people want to connect with you, uh, what's the best way? Uh, yes, I would love for you guys to visit my website. It's brinsonanderson.com. Like I said, there's a new practice startup checklist. It's a free download. Um, I also have a series of interviews with other professionals um, on all the things you need to know when starting a practice. It's on a YouTube channel that is linked on my website. 
Um, and then my Instagram handle is Amy Anderson MBA. And I have tried to embrace the, the social media culture and, and do videos and reels about just all kinds of little nuggets that you need to know when starting or running a medical practice. So awesome. Thank you for being on the practice of the practice podcast. Thanks for having me. You know, as we talk about automation, uh, AI is making things so much easier. Uh, one of our newest sponsors, Upheal, uh, I'm so excited about them. Uh, they are saving people six to 10 hours a week by helping automate your progress notes 90% faster. Uh, one of the things I love about them is that just a few minutes after you finish the session, you get a pre-drafted editable progress note that's gonna have a session summary and a breakdown and things like having an extra set of kind of eyes and ears on it. You know, how was the talking ratio? How was the speech cadence? Um, was it tense? Um, AI is insane now, and we might as well use that to help us with our progress notes, which I, I don't know about you, but most people, that's like the bane of their existence. So uh, if you want help with Upheal, um, they're 100% HIPAA compliant. They will uh, work within your EHR, so you don't have to switch EHRs. It's gonna streamline the things uh, that are tough to do so that you can spend time with your clients. Uh, if you wanna try them out, head on over to upheal.io forward slash Joe. Again, that's upheal.io forward slash Joe. Thank you so much for letting me into your ears and into your brain. Have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Special thanks to the band Silence is Sexy for that intro music. And this podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regard to the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, the producers, the publishers, or guests are rendering legal, accounting, clinical, or other professional information. If you want a professional, you should find one. <laughs>